On this Friday night, the cascading effect of sex abuse allegations rattling the NHL. One coach quits while the last man standing is cleared by the league. What they do going ahead will be the real test. And the poisonous culture that's pervasive throughout pro sports. Updated recommendations about vaccinations. Vaccine effectiveness against infection may decrease over time in some situations. Who else should get another shot in the arm? Breaking news, Ottawa's decision to appeal compensation for Indigenous children. And grateful for a miracle. Say thank you for everything. A COVID survivor returns to the hospital that saved his life. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Chris Galis. Good evening and thanks for joining us. More fallout today from the scandal involving allegations of sexual assault that's rocked the National Hockey League. The NHL says it will not discipline Winnipeg Jets general manager Kevin Dayoff, a one-time Chicago Blackhawks executive over that team's handling of accusations against a former video coach in 2010. Late last night, Florida Panthers coach Joel Quenville resigned over the case. Now, both were with the Blackhawks when player Kyle Beach reported that he was sexually assaulted. Allegations he claims were ignored. Mike Relay explains in our top story tonight. Connor DeSmit. From up high overlooking the ice, there's no question who's in charge of the Jets. 11 years ago, Kevin Cheveldayoff had far less power as an assistant general manager for the Chicago Blackhawks. That saved him in his current job, as NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman decided he cannot assign to him responsibility for Chicago's actions or inactions. A month before the Blackhawks won the 2010 Stanley Cup, aspiring NHLer Kyle Beach reported to the team that he had been sexually assaulted by video coordinator Brad Aldrich. An explosive report released this week found that senior management decided it was more important to focus on hockey and ultimately allowed Aldrich to resign a month later to avoid an investigation. The story has sent shockwaves through the hockey world, enraging former players who were once victims of predators. What goes through my mind is that uh, we just don't get it. Like, we just don't get it. Chicago's inaction, as well as its letter of recommendation, led Aldrich to a job with his hometown high school, where he was convicted of assaulting a teenager for which Beach feels partially responsible. My message to him was that I'm sorry, because I feel like maybe I could have done more then to protect him. Beach's story has reignited the conversation about the sometimes toxic and homophobic culture in sports. <laughs> In the background of that 2010 Chicago celebration, a homophobic slight meant to emasculate an opponent is clearly written on the wall. Um, this is all about power and who has the power and what they are doing with it and why. How to address that overriding issue is the question, with many calling on the NHL to appoint an independent body to field complaints. What they do going ahead will be the real test of their sincerity and, mm -hmm. and their commitment to this. Nothing can erase what happened, but the Hockey Hall of Fame has agreed to do its part and look at Xing out Aldrich's name on the cup. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Turning to the pandemic now, Canadian health officials are expanding eligibility guidelines for COVID-19 booster shots. Jamie Marocker shows us who's on the list now and now that Pfizer has been approved for use in 5 to 11-year-olds in the United States, why parents here still have to wait. Ten months after her second vaccine, emergency room nurse Nancy Halupa can now re-up on her COVID-19 immunity with a booster. It would just be that added insurance that we have another layer of protection. Frontline healthcare workers, seniors over 80, and adults in First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities are strongly recommended by Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI, to get their third COVID shot at least six months after a second. Seniors 70 to 79 may also be offered boosters, as well as Canadians who have received two doses of AstraZeneca or one of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. These vaccine recipients may be susceptible to infection sooner. Viral vector vaccines have been found to be less effective than mRNA shots, which Dr. Teresa Tam says are providing strong, sustained protection. 
for the general population, there is agreement that they don't need the vaccine uh, in any uh, short, immediate future. Still, provinces and territories seem to be making their own plans when it comes to boosters. Already, B.C., Yukon and the Northwest Territories are offering third shots to certain populations, with Ontario to follow next week. Meantime, parents are left wondering when they can expect first doses for kids. I'm excited for them uh, because it'll protect them, especially that they're in daycare and school. According to Canadian health officials, Pfizer's pediatric formula won't be approved until mid to late November. I think it's important that we don't cut any corners and we continue to trust the, the process. A process that requires patience, one in place to protect even the youngest of Canadians. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. The federal government is announcing some exemptions and a grace period for unvaccinated travelers in Canada. Starting tomorrow, passengers aged 12 and up are required to be fully vaccinated to board domestic and international flights, trains and cruise ships. Travelers who've not completed the vaccination process can show proof of a valid COVID-19 molecular test until November 29th. The transport minister says there will be some exceptions, including religious or medical reasons and emergencies. And people in remote fly-in communities accessing essential services will also be exempt. Breaking news now from Ottawa. The Liberal government is appealing a federal court ruling over compensation for First Nations children. The Human Rights Tribunal ordered the government to pay each child removed from their home and their parents or grandparents $40,000, which would leave Ottawa on the hook for billions. But late this afternoon, the government also announced that it will work with First Nations groups to come to an agreement on compensation by December. Canada cho chose to file a notice of appeal today because we are concerned about imposing a one-size-fits-all approach. We've said this before. Know that, this is, that it is our steadfast goal to reach an agreement outside the courtroom Today's decision is the latest in a lengthy court battle. Raquel Fletcher has more from Ottawa. In 2016, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found Ottawa discriminated against First Nations children by knowingly underfunding child and family services on reserve. This led to as many as 60,000 kids being taken away from their families and put in foster care. Then on top of that, we had those inequalities in services were resulting in denials of services that not only harm children, but in fact have in legal orders been linked to the deaths of some children. On this much, the federal government agrees, but it has not accepted how to compensate residential school survivors and their families, despite calls from Indigenous leaders and opposition parties. And further, we are committed to working with partners to end this uh, harmful system and to make sure that kids at risk get to stay in their communities. Where we're at is this will be the 21st time the Trudeau government has gone back to court to try and overturn a court ruling and they've lost every single time. Come on, Justin, look at the, look at the odds. You're not going to win this one. Do the right thing by the kids. Angus says if the government is really serious about reconciliation, it needs to give up this legal battle and pay what it owes Indigenous children now. Raquel Fletcher, Global News, Ottawa. And coming up a little bit later, we look at the role Indigenous education can play in reconciliation and why some say there's a need for a national curriculum. But first, the Prime Minister has wrapped up his trip to the Netherlands, focusing on our historic ties with the country, but also looking towards a cleaner, greener future. Mike Le Couture is travelling with the PM as Trudeau gears up for back-to-back -back summits focusing on climate change and how to tackle it. A solemn ceremony marking a 76-year friendship between two countries forged by a war and nurtured by time. Accompanied by Canadian-born Dutch Princess Marguerite, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau laid a wreath in the Canadian War Cemetery, honouring the lives lost when our country helped liberate the Netherlands in the Second World War. It is an honour to address you today in this historic hall. In the same room where Winston Churchill called for a united Europe in 1948, Truro called for a united front in the fight against extremism. It's not just conspiracy theorists and marginalized angry people online. It's state actors too. 
using disinformation, propaganda, and cyber warfare. Now, Trudeau didn't name China in his speech, but when answering a question from a Dutch parliamentarian, he said that country poses tremendous challenges around the world to democracies and our trading system. Trudeau also urged unity against the threat of climate change. That you will, uh, that Canada will go for a much higher ambition when it comes to climate change. In a Q&A session following the speech, a Green Party member asked Trudeau about going beyond the April promise to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 45 percent by the year 2030. The Prime Minister reiterated Canada's commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, adding, our country is a fossil fuel producing nation. We would not move forward on announcing targets where we didn't have a concrete and real plan to meet them. Now, reaching those targets is a shared priority of Trudeau and his Dutch counterpart. Part of the reason for their meeting Thursday was to prepare to rally other G20 leaders to join in the climate fight at this weekend summit in Rome. There will be a lot of work being done in Rome tomorrow and on Sunday. And at least the two of us will work very hard to do whatever we can uh, to bring our colleagues uh, along in the G20. A task that could prove difficult as some of the largest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions that continue to resist large-scale change will be around that G20 table. Chris? Thank you, Mike. BC's premier is said to be in good spirits as he recovers from a successful surgery. John Horgan announced yesterday that he'd be undergoing a biopsy after doctors found a growth in his throat. The 62-year-old intends to keep working as he receives treatment and has no plans to step down. The Premier's office says further updates will be issued in the coming days. New details about a series of violent attacks in Winnipeg. Coming up, what we're learning about the victims and the accused. Plus, the debris from a disastrous container ship fire now littering a pristine section of B.C. shoreline. More details are coming to light about the victims in a string of violent attacks in Manitoba. Within hours yesterday, a Winnipeg hospital supervisor was viciously stabbed and two people were found dead, including a 73-year-old woman in the rural community of New Bothwell. Joe Scarpelli has more. It's a series of violent attacks that's left people in Manitoba shaken. I'm shocked, uh, just to be frank. Judy Swain was the first victim, found dead in her home south of Winnipeg early Wednesday afternoon, now being remembered as a hard-working farmer with a joy for life who loved to dance. She was just this very bright light. Um, I think probably most people who would have interacted with her at a, at a farmer's market or on her farm would have, will be very surprised to learn uh, that you know she was in her 70s. Shocking too, the reality that her son was a suspect in her killing. Before police could locate him, there were reports of a stabbing at Seven Oaks Hospital in Winnipeg. Police say the attacker there worked at the hospital. When he entered Wednesday, he stabbed a colleague repeatedly. She is Candace Swarek. The hospital says Swarek was speaking with a colleague when the suspect walked through the doors, passed security, and attacked her. The hospital's CEO says the chaos went on for minutes in front of staff, patients, and their families. We had uh, a number of staff that uh, jumped the individual, uh, managed to uh, take them off of the individual that was being assaulted. Um, and, uh, and then hospital staff reacted immediately to care for uh, their, their co-worker. Swarek, a longtime hospital worker in her 60s, was rushed for treatment and remains in intensive care. The suspect, a man in his 30s, was arrested on site. As the investigation unfolded Wednesday, police went to his father's home, where disturbingly, he too was found dead. Really nice man, actually. It's shocking to see that there's tape around there to wake up in the morning. The suspect remains in custody and has not yet been charged as he undergoes a medical assessment. Insight into his motives and his mental health, just some of the questions still under investigation. Joe Scarpelli, Global News, Winnipeg. Disgraced fashion mogul Peter Nygaard has made his first appearance in a Toronto courtroom. The 80-year-old appeared by video conference from an Ontario jail cell. Nygaard is facing several charges, including sexual assault. 
The court heard today the accusations involve seven different women. Nygaard did not enter a plea during the brief appearance. He's due back in court November 12th for a bail hearing. And the obstruction of justice trial for retired General Jonathan Vance has been scheduled for May 2023. An Ottawa court made that decision today during a brief video conference. The charge against Vance stems from accusations he repeatedly asked a woman to lie to investigators who were looking into allegations of sexual misconduct. Vance retired shortly after that investigation began. Some new video to show you now of the wreckage left behind by a shipping mishap off the west coast of B.C. Containers from the MV Zim Kingston are now washing up on the pristine shoreline of northern Vancouver Island. Some containers have broken apart, littering everything from fridges to toys to clothing on the beaches. 109 containers fell from the vessel during a weekend storm. A fire on board that ship is now out. Just ahead, a school in the forest, part of a movement to include indigenous education in the curriculum. With the discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves at former residential school sites, a national conversation is underway into Canada's treatment of Indigenous people. Part of that conversation includes how we share the Indigenous experience and teachings with students. As Alison Vushnik reports, some say a commitment to education is the key. How many of you cut wood to stay warm in the winter? At Glen Allen Elementary in Edmonton, Indigenous education is woven into the fabric of the day. We're here today in the forest because this is our university. On this day, Elder Wilson is sharing traditions and appreciation of the land. Later, he meets with school administrators to review programming. This school is a model for what Indigenous education looks like when developed in partnership with Indigenous leaders. I tell my students every day, you know what, what I'm teaching you, your parents are my age, if not a bit older. So when they went to school, they didn't learn this because all this history basically was erased. But without a national mandatory curriculum, these teachings and experiences aren't required in all schools. Education is the key to change. Education is the only way to create real, long-term, sustainable change. Even in the past few years, there were incidents of public school students in different parts of the country being asked to describe the advantages or benefits of residential schools. There are still definitely, you know, bias and racist resources that are kicking around. They're not as easy to find, which is a good thing. Education professor Pamela Toulouse has written more than 50 teaching resources. She says it's a matter of commitment. If Indigenous content is not mandatory or else if it's viewed as, you know, an elective, then I can guarantee that Indigenous peoples are also viewed at the same level. Do we still have our, our languages? Yeah. yeah. Do we still have our cultures? Yeah. Back in Edmonton, teachers, students and Indigenous leaders here are an example of how education can drive change. Our students are the ones who are going to educate their parents, their friends, other people in the community. Give yourself a round of applause. Alison Vushnik, yeah, Global News. There's much more to that story, and you can watch the full report on the new reality tomorrow night at 7, right here on Global. <laughs> Next, a heartfelt thank you for life-saving help. The Queen has now been told to rest for at least the next two weeks. The advice comes from her doctors after she was taken to the hospital for tests more than a week ago. The 95-year-old can still take on light duties, including some virtual audiences, but traveling and bigger events are out. Doctors and nurses at an Ontario ICU just experienced something they thought might never be possible about 18 months ago. Their first critical care COVID-19 patient, who some thought wouldn't survive, returned to the facility to thank the frontline health care workers who helped save his life. Karen Lieberman brings us his story. It is a bittersweet day for Mario Castillo. He has returned to the intensive care unit where he spent nine weeks in the spring of 2020 attached to a ventilator. 
it was our first patient with COVID that needed to be intubated. So I did have an idea, oh, this is going to be a long, long-term ventilation. The recovery has also been long and painful. We sat down with him when he arrived at St. John's Rehab. It's my second chance. Castillo has since learned to walk again, and he's regaining the feeling in his hands. No 100 percent, but I start to move. But before I stay like that, no pain in my legs. Uh, I feel like numb. So much has changed since Mario Castillo was a patient here in the ICU in the first wave. At the time, the medical team wasn't certain he was going to make it. I remember how uh, worried we were for him um, because we, you know, we didn't know that much about the disease then. We didn't know what his outcome was going to be. Castillo defied the odds and the former patient is back with a heart filled with gratitude. Say thank you for everything. To the frontline healthcare workers who saved his life. Oh, it's a miracle. What well, almost actually took my breath away to see him. I had goosebumps. As program director supporting the critical care team, Cecile Marville Williams has been dealing with her own loss. I too lost my mom to COVID. And to see him today walking, talking, to be able to come back and give back to us by sharing his experience uh, just made me feel very overwhelmed. The road back from COVID-19 has been a difficult one for Castillo, but with the support of his care team, the future is bright. Karen Lieberman, Global News. Amazing recovery. And that is Global National for this Friday night. I'm Chris Galis. Tonight's Your Canada is the water tower in Wetaskiwin, Alberta, built in 1909. The city says it's Canada's oldest functioning water tower. We love seeing Your Canada, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks very much for watching. Robin Gill will be at the anchor desk tomorrow. Have a great weekend and happy Halloween.